today. Uh, we have the uh, fortune to have Salt of the Earth down in Fenville. Who's been there? I, somebody raised their hand before. Holy cow. Look at that. Thank you. A lot of big support. Uh, Matthew Peach is the, is the head chef there. He is not, he is not here today. Uh, but we have uh, his Sue, which is uh, uh, Chris Dobler. And the Sue, is, that's a French name, uh, is the uh, next in line right behind the, the head chef. And uh, Chris has been around uh, from my hometown in Chicago. He's been in Boulder, Colorado, and then and come out here. So he's got a lot of, a lot of experiences. Uh, Matthew, Matthew uh, is going to also be here. He runs the, the front head of the restaurant. And talking about, he's got talking about some whiskey today, some rye whiskey. This was kind of cool. We're going to cook with this, and we're going to do some exciting things over charcoals, which uh, I do cook on the gas grill outside. So. I'm guilty, we don't use the charcoal enough and take our time, but that's gonna be very cool. Uh, salt, salt of the earth, basically, uh, Matthew Peach's comments, cooking in the moment focuses on freshness and, and uh, creativity. Uh, the, the head chef at, uh, at the Salt of the Earth, he, uh, he's a West Michigan native. Uh, he was involved in hospitality since 1997, went to Grand Rapids Community College, so a very, very local uh, chef. He had his apprenticeship with the uh, U.S. National Pastry Team. I didn't even know we had one of those, but that sounds pretty, pretty uh, impressive. Working as a pastry chef, he moved, uh, moved to Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, the head chef, at, again, I'm talking about at uh, Salt of the Earth. He operated at Opus One, uh, serving, uh, serving the advertising group at Ford uh, Motor. Uh, worked at uh, Detroit Steakhouse Roast, very famous one. And uh, then he moved from there to, to found Salt of the Earth in 2009. So we want you to go out and visit them. So uh, one of his comments uh, uh, that he wrote uh, before, food can only be as good as the ingredients you start with. That's pretty obvious. It's important to honor the ingredients of those who brought them to us. It doesn't start with us. We are part of the cycle. And we want to recognize and honor all the parts. And today we're going to do that as we have all these fresh ingredients in front of us. So without any further ado, Matthew, you can take it over. Excellent. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Everybody hear me? Yeah. We're good? Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we love Local First. Their ideas on, on economy, on collaboration, um, uh, on where to shop are, are brilliant and like-minded with our ideals at the restaurant. Um, like he said, we're salt of the earth out of Fenville. Um, we'll, we'll say, sure, we'll say farm to table. Uh, we believe that we're ingredient focused. And the idea behind being ingredient focused is really taking the time not only to make sure that you're, you're bringing in the right vegetables, uh, the right meat, working with the right producers, but, but honoring a relationship more than a transaction and something that's very important to us. Not only are we ingredient focused, but, uh, but we're a scratch kitchen. And scratch kitchen means we bring in whole ingredients from our producers, from our purveyors, and we break them down. So, just north of Zealand, uh, our, our, our hog farmer uh, raises Berkshire pigs for us, and the whole pig come in, comes in and we break it down and we use the entire animal. Um, all, of our, all of our red meats come, down, come from Middlebrook, which is uh, down outside of Three Oaks. Um, so uh, this is just, this is near and dear to our heart. I also want to thank Visser, who provided with us with all these beautiful vegetables today. Um, we'll, we'll be celebrating our fifth birthday in August. And uh, the first two years were pretty rough, and we spent a lot of time running around farmers markets uh, garnering vegetables. And uh, we owe a big thank you to Visser's, not only from today, but uh, providing a foundation for us uh, at Salt of the Earth. Um, we've got a great show today. Chris is going to be kind of taking um, some of the hassle out of grilling, uh, teaching you how to work with flank steak, how to work with a brined half chicken, um, and grill vegetables. I'm going to be making a cocktail, which I feel is like the preeminent grilling cocktail. I call it grilled lemonade. There's a recipe on your recipe sheets for that as well. Um, and we'll get started. I'm going to start with the cocktail. Uh, what we're going to be using is uh, a white whiskey, which is from Journeyman Distillery, which is down in Three Oaks again. Uh, it's a rye mash whiskey, really delicate, really soft, and there's a little bit of florality to it. Give me one second here. I can, I can probably do it. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Beautiful. All right. So we're going to do a half ounce of the, uh, 
the white rye whiskey, it gets, it's aged 24 hours in neutral oak barrels. It's gonna go right into our Boston shaker. We are going to juice. And if you don't own one of these, if you don't own one of these, they are awesome. Just a little half lemon juicer. So it's about one ounce of lemon juice. Say about a half ounce of simple syrup, just sugar, water, boil it down. This is Angostura bitters. It's an aromatic bitters. Comes from the West Indies. Um, the bittering uh, that's used in it is a Genetian root. It's only only from uh, Trinidad in the West Indies. We're gonna do three dashes of that. The idea with bitters is it allows you to kind of take some of the sour, some of the sweetness, and balance out a cocktail. It really doesn't add a lot to the flavor profile but it'll just balance everything out. Okay, so we've got our whiskey, we've got our simple syrup, um, and our bitters, lemon juice, and then we've grilled a lemon wheel. So grilled lemonade, we drop the lemon wheel in, a sprig of thyme. Get some ice working here. We're gonna pre, for TV, we're going to uh, pre-ice our glass. But feel free, if you just want to shake it and pour right into, uh, right into the glass, it's all good. We're going to shake pretty vigorously. Just get everything moving in there. Some of the char is going to break off the lemon. Kind of, you know, if, if it was an aged whiskey, it's going to give you a little bit of the flavor profile from, uh, from the barrel. We're going to strain right into the glass. And then we're going to garnish with a sprig and a lemon wheel. And that's the show. So it's great, you know, everybody wants a cocktail, a beer while they're grilling. Um, this is a great opportunity while your grill is going, grill your lemon, move forward on your cocktail. We call it grilled lemonade. And I'll, I'll, I'll let Chris take over from here. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Chris. So today we're going to be talking about chicken and flank steak, uh, and more importantly, charcoal. Uh, with uh, summer right around the corner, everybody's going to be barbecuing next week. So I wanted to talk about the proper way to set up your grill so you're uh, going to have some happy people eating. So first thing off, you want to get your, your embers burning. If you have a... Uh, charcoal starter right over here. You're going to get those started, get them nice and hot, and get them into the grate. Now a lot of people will just pour them all over the grate, not really care about it. So you want to get all your embers on one side, you want to get them nice and hot, and you want to get them burning down. Um, when you get your meat on the grill, you don't want to see the flames popping up. Uh, essentially what's that, what that's going to do is it's going to burn the meat, you're going to have that bitter taste, um, it's just not going to be good for it. So after your, uh, after your charcoals are nice and burned down, you can get your meat on the grill. And for, uh, for your steaks, you want to get that nice, that nice cross mark like you see in the restaurants. So what we'll do is we'll get that on the hottest part of the grill. Now you can tell that not only because the charcoal is, is on that side, but also if you just look at the grate, it's going to be white hot. So what you're going to do is you're going to get that steak right on the grill. You don't want to see that. <laughs> yeah, so why it flamed up is one, because of the oil on the marinade, and two, uh, because my embers haven't burned down far enough. So what that's going to do is kind of burn it. So you want to move that right away. <laughs> now the problem with uh, 
with chicken and with steaks, people are grilling them, they get so antsy, they want to move them around all the time. Um, and what they'll see is the skin sticking to the grill, you'll see the steaks kind of tearing off. And the problem with that is that it hasn't finished cooking. Uh, chicken and steak and fish um, have a general um, need to just kind of rest. And what they'll, what they'll do when it's done is it'll let you know when it's ready to be moved, it'll come right off the grill. So if you're pulling, you're thinking, oh my gosh, it's gonna burn, it's gonna burn. It's not going to. So to start off with this chicken, what I've done is I've created a brine. Now what a brine does is essentially it gives you insurance for your chicken, um, or you can use it with pork. And essentially what it does is you add sugar, you add salt, and whatever other flavorings you'd like to have. Just a dash of that, some seasonings. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna let the sugar and salt dissolve. You're gonna cool it down, and then you're gonna put your chicken in there. What it's gonna do is it's, pardon me, not only gonna season it, but it's also gonna let you cook it a little bit longer if you're not 100% confident with cooking with chicken or pork is you're gonna be able to cook it a little bit longer and you're not gonna get that dried chicken. So, got the brine working. Next we're gonna work on the marinade. So super simple, you can grab all the stuff at the farmer's market here. We got parsley, we got tarragon, rosemary, thyme. You're just gonna take it all, stems and everything. Get it in the blender. It's a dash of oil. And just let it go. Now after that's finished blending, you can take your meat, this works with anything, meat, fish, whatever you need. And you can just marinate in there for a day, two days, three days. It's gonna be all right. So after that's finished, like you see the chicken has that on it already, the flank steak has it on there already. We're gonna do a quick side dish. So what I got here is some, uh, some zucchini, some squash, like Matt said, it's from Visser Farm, these are beautiful. And I'm just gonna cut these in half lengthwise. And then we're gonna get these on the grill as well. Now with vegetables, you wanna keep these more on the, on the cooler side of the grill. You don't want them to get burned. These cook super quickly as well, so. You don't need to oil them. You can just get them right on there. Now the great thing about these vegetables from, uh, from Visser Farms and from all these vegetables here at the farmer's market is these farmers pick them that day or the day before and they're super fresh, so you don't really gotta do a lot to them. Um, I just got a little bit of salt on these guys. But anything more than that, and you're kinda just messing with the natural flavor that you're gonna get from it. Alrighty. So we got these still grilling. And we can work with the accompaniments to the zucchini. So what I got today here is some, uh, some Marcona almonds. If you can find these at the store, they're much better than the regular almonds you're gonna get. But they do come with a price. So we're just gonna, uh, they're called Marcona almonds. Say that again. Marcona. You can, you can possibly get them at D&W. Um, Otherwise, I know online you can search for them. I know it's kind of a hassle, hassle ordering online because you don't have it that day. But you can definitely taste the difference in it. It's, it's pretty unbelievable. So, got this brine off. Voila, chicken already. So with, this, so with that brine, you can do as much as will fill it. Um, the only thing with, 
with brines is you don't want to let it sit too long. I generally let it sit for like four to eight hours. Anything longer than that and it can start to get too salty. Um, so we got these zucchinis, we got the steak working almost done. And we can work on the side for the steak as well right now. So we got these uh, beautiful white onions. Now keep the heads on these. These are great for garnishing. They're great for, uh, for blending up. You can use it in your marinade if you want. But the whole plant works. So just going to chop these up real quick. Get these sautéing. Have a little dab of butter. And again, with this stuff, you don't need a lot of seasoning. Salt is just all you need. Just a little bit, let that cook. And these vegetables will normally take, I don't know, like two minutes on each side. Rotate them 90 degrees so you get those nice cross hatches. And you're pretty much good to go. That wooden board go. Yeah, yeah, you don't you don't need to do both sides. Um, these will cook super nice. And you want a little bit of the rawness in there too. It'll uh, it'll kind of give you a, a different texture, a different taste. Just get some Marcona almonds drizzled right over the top. Got some local goat cheese as well. Just kind of break it up. All right. And there's some zucchini almonds. It's just that simple. Next is steak. It's just about done. You can get that off. And the importance with steak and with chicken is letting it rest. You should always let it rest about, about 10 minutes or so. Um, generally, they say half the time of how long it takes to cook. Um, but I think a, just a standard time is 10 minutes. And with chicken as well, it's also important to let that rest. Now, what's happening when this steak is cooking is the juices are coming out of it. But when you let it rest, all the juices are in the middle and they're allowed to separate and disperse into the rest of the steak. So when you don't let it rest long enough, you're seeing all that blood go onto the plate. That's all the, all the, the, uh, the juices that'll go back into it and help it keep it super tender. So you can get the best steak in the world, but if you don't let it rest long enough, it's not gonna be any, any better than the stuff you get at the supermarket. So, yes ma'am. So this is a flank steak. Um, at the restaurant, we normally use hanger steaks. Um, this is what we got today. So imagine this is rested. Now, are you, are you cutting with the grain or against the grain? So with flank steaks, you're going to want to cut against the grain. So when the grain is going this way in a steak, you're going to want to cut perpendicular to it. That also helps tenderize it. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> It's a, it's a real lean cut from the bottom of the cow. Um, it gets overlooked quite frequently, but it's got great flavor. Um, and if you treat it right, it's, it's beautiful and tender. And, and this time of year, a chimichurri or any kind of, you know, any kind of herb involved with it is, is great. Well, the flank, the hanger sits, I'm gonna use myself. Uh, uh, the hanger sits directly below the diaphragm. The flank, flanks the hanger on either side and you don't get the hanger has kind of a minerality to it because it sits by the liver and so there's just you know as far as texture as far as leanness it's pretty much the same you just get a little different flavor profile from a hanger stick. Alrighty so we got our onions sauteing real quick we're gonna take some of these beautiful snap peas 
Just chop them up. Um, the steak on the grill, I cooked it medium rare. Now how you can tell it is if you take your thumb and you kind of just push on there, that's medium rare. If you kind of push it in a little bit, little bit more, that's more of a medium. And then the more you push in all the way, that's well done. Now you can kind of use that as a barometer to, uh, to how you want your steak done. And that, that is true restaurant technique. You know, they'll, they'll touch their steak just to see. I mean, they know what hot parts of the grill are, where they are. Um, and so generally, as you move through an evening, you know how things are cooking and progressing on the grill, just like you're gonna see where your hot coals are. Um, but it's, it's about just a little touch to see, see where your tenderness is. All right, so we got these onions down. We got these, uh, these sugar peas. Like I said, you don't got to do much to them. Yeah, it's about, it's about the simplicity of the ingredient. You know, when the farmers are picking them right at the prime ripeness, you really want that flavor to come through. So you don't want to over season. You don't want to get too crazy with it. Yeah, and, it, and with, that, with that being said as well, I mean, at the restaurant, we really don't do much to it. I mean, that's literally what we'll do at the restaurant. Just some butter, some onions, some peas, and that's it, just some salt. And, uh, yeah, you don't need marinades or anything like that. So we got this chicken. We'll check on it real quick. It's got a little bit ways to go. But just for time, we'll, t we'll take it off. I'll separate the leg. I can kind of slice that as well. And what you'll notice after you brine your chickens is a total difference in the flavor with it. It'll be so much more moist. And especially during Thanksgiving, people are so concerned with their turkeys drying out. This is a great way to keep your turkeys moist. I guarantee people will come to your house and tell you that's the best turkey they've ever had in their life. Do you double the brine? You can use that, that same recipe. Um, a lot of times, um, especially with turkeys, is I'll take the, uh, the breast bone and the legs off separately since they cook differently. Um, and then I'll cook the breast and the legs together in the oven. But the breast will normally be done before the legs. So you can take those out and let them rest while the legs are finishing cooking. That way your breast and your legs are gonna be, are gonna be cooked proper and not, nothing's gonna be overcooked. All right, so we got our chicken. We got our zucchini, and we're all set. Do you guys have any questions for me or for Matt? Yes, ma'am. I've never worked with brine before. Would, does it make the chicken or the meat really salty? And would you ever do it with like boneless, skinless chicken breast? I would do it with both, and yes, it can be too salty. Um, the big thing with brining being too salty is people leaving it in the liquid for too long. Now, if for some reason you have it in the fridge and you leave it in there for 12 hours and you're like, oh my gosh, I left it in there for too long, what you can do is just put it in plain water and that'll kind of suck out some of the salt. Now, what that does is it's kind of reverse osmosis and it just kind of will balance everything out. Uh, no, not necessarily. Yeah, you can do it with. Yeah, you can do it skinless. You can do it with pork. Um, you can do it with steak. You can do it with pretty much any protein. Okay. What kind of fish would you use for uh, brining? For brining, I would do. Yeah, you can do it with that. What I would do with salmon is more cure it, which is essentially a dry brine. So you're going to take those same ingredients. And you're just going to kind of sprinkle it super liberal all over the all over the fish, and let that sit for. I would say if it was like an inch thick, I would do maybe an hour or two, and then just kind of wash it off. Oh, and no water. 
No. Well, with the brine, you're going to use water. With the cure, you're just going to use just the salt and the sugar and what other, other, whatever spices. Um, with salmon, I would probably use like lemon, orange, grapefruit, um, and kind of squeeze that in with the sugar and add some more citrus flavor to it. Yes, ma'am. Do we use what? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, especially when I'm doing vegetables and, uh, and other things on the grill. Like if I'm doing fish, uh, like wrapped fish, and I'm trying to steam it, I would use the lower side of the grill. Um, the high side, where it's super hot, I would only really want to use for steaks to get like the really nice sear on it. Um, but yeah, it's really important just to keep just to keep the hot on on one side and the cold on the other. Otherwise, you're going to have hot all over and the things you don't want to overcook, like chicken, which will take a lot longer, um, you'll end up burning that. Yeah. Can you buy that locally? Yes. Um, I, I would say that King's Cove over on the south side definitely um, repeats on the north side if you're a north sider um, and maybe Lincolnshire off of 31 and Lincoln but yeah I mean they have a great line they do a line of aged whiskeys uh, they do a bourbon they do a wheat uh, they do an aged rye and then they have a line of clear spirits of course the whiskey they do rum they do vodka and if you're ever down it, it's a beautiful little distillery in the old Featherbone factory that used to make corsets um, and it's kind of a, a multi-use uh, uh, facility right now, and they've got a great little spot down there. Could you repeat the name of the whiskey? It's, uh, it's Journeyman Distillery, and it's called W.R. White Whiskey. W.R. White Whiskey, whiskey yeah. And, and if you go to, you know, there's multiple white whiskeys available. Um, I mean, white whiskey is just a romantic term for, for moonshine. Um, but, and when it, when it takes, you know, it has to do with the mash. And like I said, this is predominantly rye. Um, so, yeah, it works really well for this cocktail because of the char on the lemon. Yes. Okay, so the chicken should always be on the cooler side of the thing. And then how long do you, like, say, a um, bone-in, skin-on, chicken breast take about that? Bone-in, skin-on, chicken breast. There's not a specific time, but if you hold your thumb, it, if you right. press it, like hold your thumb all the way in. The inside, yeah, right here. Yeah, if you you don't want to feel much much pressure at so all. So no tension in your hand, and you touch it. Yeah. That's medium rare. And as you put tension and you start to flex your thumb a little bit, you'll feel that muscle kind of tighten up, and so you go from medium rare to medium, and then. It'll be cooked all the way through. Like if you put all your tension on there and kind of push on there. No, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And by resting it, it also helps cook all the way through. They say chicken should be about 165. Um, I mean, personally, I think that's a little bit, a little bit too much. But if you cook a chicken and you let it rest for 10, 15 minutes, it'll keep cooking. Absolutely, and it'll more times than not be all the way cooked through. Um, if you, say you only had one chicken breast and you just use a little bit um, and you save the, the rest of it, then you can, it'll stay forever. I mean, you can, you can keep it in your fridge and so it'll... once the protein hits... Yeah, like once it hits there, brine, then, then brine, yeah, you got to throw that. that brine yeah. Brine, yeah. But, yeah. You can, but you can portion, you can make a big portion. I think that's what Chris, and divide it up and then use it for multiple things. Yeah. Um, I would use um, the same philosophy with like chicken, or well not with chicken, with steak. Um, generally with, with salmon, if I'm cooking it on the grill, is that I'm going to have the skin on, get that nice and crispy, and then flip it over and just kind of, I would say for an inch, I would say let it sit for like four or five minutes. Um, but generally, like if you see kind of white coming out from all the, yeah. the courses, that means the, the grill is too hot. Mm -hmm. And what's essentially happening is the albumin is coming out of the salmon. Um, so yeah, that, 
that would definitely be a sign that it's too hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. You have a gas grill. Right. No, you're okay. what, what temperature do you aim for? Is it, can you adjust the flames on each side or no? Oh, you can. Okay. Then I would probably go for like 325 would probably be a good one. Yes, sir. Um, Kingsford is totally is totally fine. Um, it's kind of whatever your preference is because the exactly yeah. I mean the the theory behind it, keeping it on one side and the other, it's it's universal. And if you want to add some some different flavors to your steaks or your chicken or salmon as well, you can toss wood chips in there. You can toss rosemary, thyme in with the charcoal. Yeah, and you'll kind of get that smoke and that nice but scent from there. If you don't own one of these, you need to make an investment. Chimney charcoal, I mean, in 10 minutes, the core of your charcoals are, are red hot, and that's going to heat the rest of your grill, and you don't have to wait around and try to relight or, you know, have briquettes that have lighter fluid on, it, on them already. So this is, this is a great tool. Yes, absolutely. At the restaurant, that's that's what we'll do. Um, you know, either a day ahead or you know the day of. But yeah, they'll hold. Yes, ma'am. Um, I do charcoal all the time, but you mentioned wood chips. How would that work? So, if you were to do uh, just straight wood chips instead of charcoal. Or do you combine them? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, what I would do with wood chips if I was combining it is I would use it more just to add that smoke, like if I was using hickory or uh, apple wood or cherry wood or something like that, I would use that just for, for the smoke. And you can add that in after you get your original charcoal in the grill. You can just kind of dump those wood chips right on top. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and what I would do with the wood chips is I would soak them in water for a day or so just to kind of get them uh, nice and wet. And then once you put them on there, then the smoke will kind of come off there. And that's what kind of what you're looking for, is it'll last longer as well. OK. Sir? We're in Fenville. We're about 20 miles south of here. Um, uh, Fenville's a, a little fruit growing community, <laughs> about 1,400 people, um, well known for cranes in Fen Valley. Um, it's also, uh, it's growing as, as a, a cultural hub artist. Um, Virtue Cider uh, has just opened their cider mill there. Um, I, I don't know if anybody knows this, but um, AVA, American Viticulture Area, uh, Fen Valley, the Fen Valley was the third AVA named uh, in the early 80s after Napa and Sonoma in California. So obviously those are big names um, and Fen Valley was named right behind there. Uh, because of, of Doug Welsh, who, who owns Fen Valley Winery. But yeah, and we're right downtown, 114 East Main Street. Uh, a lot of exciting things happening. Uh, you know, because we cook seasonally, uh, winter, we get really creative with root vegetables and beets and, and, uh, and microgreens and things like that. But once things start coming out of the ground, we get real excited. Um, we extend our menu and, and bring on all kinds of different preps. Um, so it's an exciting time. We're also uh, Sunday morning from 11 to 2. We're open for brunch now. And we've got a specific menu for brunch. I've got a couple menus if anybody wants to take a look um, right here. Uh, different, obviously, more breakfast styled items, um, but you know, the great salt of the earth touch. Any questions? Awesome. Enjoy your day. Thank you guys so much.